A historic year for women in politics, replete with highs and lows. Clinton failed to break the highest and hardest glass ceiling. I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. But female candidates broke through barriers across the country. Tonight on The Hinkley Report. Both candidates vied for the female vote throughout the election. How did Trump win white women in traditionally blue states? Why wasn't the gender gap larger than anticipated? And how did Utahns react to the portrayal of women in the election? Preliminary results show we may see a new batch of women in our state legislature. Mia Love is poised to return to Congress with a decisive victory. What role did Utah women play in the local and national elections? And how will this divisive election impact their political engagement? Good evening, and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I am Morgan Lyoncotti, State Program Manager at the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Jennifer Dobner, reporter with the Salt Lake Tribune, Michelle Mumford, former Utah GOP officer, and Luz Escamilla, Democratic State Senator. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. We have a lot to talk about. This was obviously a very historic year from a woman at the top of the Democratic ticket to women really being featured within the media, within the campaigns. So Jennifer, let's have you answer the first question. The election didn't end up being as historic as most people thought it would be. So how is it perceived? Is it a loss for women? Is it still a victory and how so? Well, maybe it's both. Um, I think it's definitely a gain for women when a major political party nominates a woman. It's the first time. Um, I don't know if it matters what party you're in. I think everybody gets some chills from that. If you are female, I think the conversation is different when women are at the table and we made advances there for our gender. Um, obviously, a lot of people are also disappointed because it didn't turn out the way many people wanted. Um, and why that happened is probably a really complicated answer that I'm not smart enough to give you. And we'll get to the results in a little in a minute, but first let's talk about how Senator or how Secretary Clinton was perceived and some of the other women within the campaign. So Senator Escamilla, you've run campaigns. Was it interesting for you to watch really how carefully the Clinton campaign crafted how she appeared, what she was wearing, these very careful answers she gave at debates? Um, and I even noticed that a lot of times we see candidates say, you know, as your next governor, as your next president. And with her, she was very careful to always say, if I'm so fortunate to be the next president. What were your thoughts on that? You know, I, I think there's different standards for women. I mean, I we sometimes don't want to admit, but it's true. They they tend to, not, you can be too aggressive, because that doesn't make you look good. You can be too weak, right? I mean, if you're sensitive, or, you know, you, you can be too weak. So I, it obviously played in the election. It was very clear. I mean, we were there were conversations about her lipstick. We never have conversations about the color, even of the tie that the men are, are wearing. So I, it, it was unfortunate. I think what I personally learned is it's happening at that level. It happens at the local level. And, and there are different standards. So we're not there yet. I think it's true that this was a victory in the sense of um, as a woman, as someone that has four daughters. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to what happened. It was, it, was, it was nice to see that. But we're not there yet. But absolutely, I mean, we're talking about her clothes, right? I mean, when do you talk about what brand or, you know, what what is the candidate wearing? With her, it was, what is she wearing? What color is she using? And also, I think you're right. I think the campaign was way too careful. And that also maybe may have lost some of the, rea the real her, right? Because she is, at the end of the day, a, a regular human being. And when you're too crafted, it can look too, too crafted. Yeah. And the standards, they are different, you know, and, and, and people do expect different things from women and, and unreasonable things from women. But it also goes to what we expect of ourselves. You know, it's common that women don't think that they're qualified for a position when you know, a male with the same, um, you know, the same degrees or, or whatever would, be, would think that he was qualified. And so that goes to the fact that she didn't assume that she would win, right? So she doesn't say, when I'm your president, which is much more 
strong and, and, and so. forceful and confident, you know, and, and a man will, will stand up and say, when I am your president, because of course I'm going to win because I'm the best candidate. And, and we're yet to do that. It's like we can't escape that sort of Ginger Rogers standard, right? Everything we do, we have yeah. to do backwards and in high heels. We have to be right. that much better. Women have to be that much better to get over, to get through that glass ceiling, which we're closer than we maybe we've ever been. Uh, but we're just not there yet. Well, and it, it, it is interesting that we see research that shows that women feel like they have to be overqualified before they're willing to jump into public office, whereas men may have the confidence. And was that a theme? You know, the Democrats, especially the Clinton camp, like to talk about how she was the most qualified candidate to ever run for the presidency. And some Republicans took umbrage with that and pointed out some of their own candidates. Um, but then on the other side, we have Donald Trump, who has never held elected office. And obviously, there's so many complications and other parts of the story, but was that gender issue a part of the discussion? I, I do think that there's a part of it that is just that there's maybe some electoral fatigue with Clintons, okay. period. Sure. That, yeah. that they have been in public life for so many years. Dynasty. That, yeah. That, yeah, we have a sort of bad reaction to the right. dynasty yeah. idea in right. our country. So maybe that's p part of it, and maybe part of it is part of the country's just not ready for a woman to have that job. Let's talk about some of the other women that were involved with the campaign. Michelle Obama just electrified some of the audiences and some of the rallies that she attended and gave really eloquent and powerful speeches. Now that she's out of the White House, will she follow that same track that, honestly, Hillary Clinton did? Do you think we see her in public office? I think it's being talked about, and, and so is Chelsea Clinton for that matter, but I think that goes to our fatigue of having this one, this track of, you know, you, you have to first be a, a wife and then you can go up. And you know that's, and there that's is a negative. Some, yeah, there is that historical precedent that women would take their husbands' places right. if they died in and office. go up yeah. on their on his coattails. Yeah. Um, but um, but you know, but Michelle is highly qualified. I mean, again, going back to qualifications, right? right? Um, like Hillary is obviously. I mean, so um, I think it's also think about the family dynamic. And you know, I, my husband was a former state legislator and mayor and. We talk about you know what would it take to have two of two of us um, serving at the right. same time, and right. what what does that mean for your family dynamic? I think I don't know that she necessarily wants it. She's great. She's a great public speaker, like you know President Obama is. <clears throat> but you're right. I think in the United States we have a resistance towards f three families in the White House right. in the last you know in a generation, two generations. Right, it goes right? to that dynasty, and that's because. Americans love the story of the American middle, dream. yeah, middle class. You know, you you work yourself, you work your way up, and you and you you know you you do hard work, and then it'll succeed, and you'll succeed, and it'll work out, and not you know just um, China plate to China plate to China plate. And, you know, I, I know that his China plate doesn't even make sense there, but you know the the idea is that you're you're An born into it. An entitlement, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. So we just mentioned Chelsea Clinton. Ivanka Trump was also a major part of the Trump campaign. Jennifer, what role do you think she'll have? Do you think she'll be one of the inner circle, or do you think some are saying she might take on some of the first lady traditional roles? I don't think we know yet, but we got a glimpse this week. She sat in on a uh, mis uh, meeting with uh, uh, officials from Japan. And so I think, you know, what I think we see right now is that Donald Trump as a president will not do the things that we expect that presidents have always done. That he's going to bring his sort of business thinking, calling the shots, uh, making the decisions into the White House, and that's not going to fit the mold that most of us are used to. So I, I, I would expect his all of his children, including his daughter, will play a role. How that works, I, you know, we have to wait and see. I think. And what about her role during the campaign? She was put in a pretty precarious situation when she was having to apologize for her father after the Access Hollywood tape. So, Senator, I mean, how do you, how does a daughter do this dance? What was her role, and do you think she was effective in those apologies? Um, you know, I think it, it brought s some level of, of human touch to to Donald Trump, um, and I I give her credit. I mean, that's her dad. I love my dad. I, I, I don't know that anybody could criticize that she was trying to defend her dad. Um, but but I, it was interesting because she seems very eloquent, um, probably more eloquent than the, um, the wife of, of Mr. Trump. And I, I think she 
could probably do more of a proactive role than than his wife. But at the same time, then going back to nepotism almost, right? I mean, th it's like, wait, now it's an entitlement because they're your children? Not that they're not qualified. Again, um, they seem some of them obviously have some good uh, professional experience in the business sector. But it's quite, I mean, it's almost weird. It's, it's like, oh, this is totally going to be a different presidency and, and what we can expect is probably going to be a surprise but not so much of a surprise anymore like and anything could happen and you would but you know it because you're in in the state legislature government doesn't function the way business functions absolutely and so I I think we're gonna see some hiccups because you can't just I don't think you can't just put your kid <laughs> you can't just not only let your kids run the show but maybe also you can't run the government like a business, business. Uh, it, yeah. it doesn't and and there might be ways in which business practices might improve government function but you know turning that titanic overnight is not going to be easy but essentially it didn't matter how her apologies were taken mm -hmm. because when you are um, reaching only for one demographic you're not going to get the whole story you know the, the, the gender gap if, if you and unfortunately um, it, the polls showed that women cared more about those issues than men did. Of course they care about them, but they don't take them into the election box with them like men do. And if you are only reaching out to women, you're not going to win because you've, you've left the men behind. Right. But so, I, you oh. know, and I just want to add, because I, that's an important piece, I think, about this election cycle. What we learn from this election cycle on this specific issue regarding uh, the comments made by Mr. Trump is that uh, we still live in a uh, an okay culture of assault and you know I don't care your political views that was pretty brutal it's wrong it's wrong yeah. it was gross yeah. it was I mean in so many levels but it's actually assault and I almost wanted to go when we had you know you, your conversations here and there people were almost like dismissive of the assault piece I'm like are they not reading state statute I mean well. you know because it is against the law to touch someone if they don't want to be touched I mean regardless of how you feel about the person or not so to me was what an eye opening about the culture of assault that we still okay in this country. Uh, was that a decisive piece for someone when they go and vote for someone? You know that obviously the answer is no, it wasn't for many women. But I mean, for many it was so eye opening. And I think in 2016, we cannot say that we're better than other places in terms of how we perceive sexual assault. Other nations. Uh, and other nations, yeah. 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 So talking about how people decided to vote, one of the things that really surprised people, though not Kellyanne Conway, who also broke a glass ceiling by being the first female to lead a winning campaign. presidential campaign, oh, right. um, she said that Trump would get the female vote. And we did see that he did win, a win among white, not college educated women. So why was it that perhaps those comments about harassment and comments about assault didn't affect those women as much. Why did they still, Jennifer, maybe you answer this one, why did they still vote for I, Trump? I, I don't know if I can answer that uh, because I think I sort of share Luz's perspective that those things are not okay and it's against the law. So I'm not, I'm not sure how women can uh, excuse, excuse it or ignore it, although certainly it's not the only factor you, you take into the ballot box. Um, I think there are still a lot of conservative uh, women out there who um, are not ready to have another woman in the White House, and they still defer to men to make the big decisions. And um, maybe you guys can help. I think help. it was the message. I think the the Democrats over the past ten years have um, have have switched to a, a, an, an elitist or you know an, a highly educated you know. Um, uh, college-educated demographic, and 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 they've ignored the middle class. And if you ignore the middle class, you're not going to get all of those women that are in that middle class. That they're in charge of the pocketbooks, and right. they felt, you know, the they felt the effects of of, of Obamacare and um, you know the the. And not having the money that they, they well, need and to certainly have. Well, certainly the economic recovery has, has, barely has, not, yeah. right. has not really helped a lot some of these voters. And so they're, they're voting with their, what Bill Clinton said it himself years ago, it's the economy, right. stupid. Okay. Right. And I only and so say Democrats, you know, I'm not trying to pick them up, but I, as far as the numbers show us, the, the gender gap, when, when it has been the largest, the Democrats have done the worst. When the, when the gender gap 
closes, the, the you know, Republicans are, are doing better. Or I don't know if that's the case, but when the gender cap has been the largest, the Democrats have lost those big races. And you saw in Colorado, Udall went after that that woman vote, right? He was called uterus Udall or, or whatever it was. And he increased the Democrats' share of women votes in, in Colorado that, that year. But he lost his, his, his share of white men went down to like 43%. You, you just can't be so demographic when you're looking for, uh, when, you're, when you're campaigning. You have to appeal to, to more people. You know, it can't be I'm the woman, you know, I, and I'm going to vote about women's issues. It has to be I'm the better candidate, and this and this and this is why. Well, so this and I do agree with. Sorry. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to say that just because, like, all three of us are women that we think the same way about right. all Correct. issues. And, and the idea that you should vote for a woman because it's time for a woman to be in office, it, it, it is, is, doesn't make sense to me. It has to be the right candidate. But Man I'm or woman, it has to be the right candidate for me as a voter and my values. And I think women, women chose the person that they felt re best represented their values. But even further, women who campaign on women's issues. Right. You know, you know well, access to um, you know, medical care or, or abortion or you know, jobs, jobs rights or maternity leave, those aren't going to be the only issues that are going to win the, the larger demographic. In, you know, and I, I think it's, you mentioned something interesting, you know, the, the lasting years of the Democrats and the message, right? I'm going to now shift it a little bit because I think the Republicans' message for the last 10 years of fear against immigrants and everything that looks different also paid off. I mean, absolutely. So when you're in a panic attack and you see an election cycle that was so long and tiring and people fighting and fighting and people calling each other, the FBI involved investigations, you know, whether they were valid or not, yeah, I mean, the person then, it's at a point where you're like, wait, what is more simple to me than my 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 pocket right i mean right. i do have enough money in my bank account and obviously the working class have been suffering we're still trying to get out of a horrible recession so it is also a call maybe on who was in leadership at that point right so i think there were bigger factors but to me when you look at the minorities for example so hispanic black women voted with clinton by a chunk even more than obama potentially i mean we're still getting the final numbers but so i mean women white women you know in that blue color maybe bracket you're right i mean and and it hurt the final election cycle right because at the end it's those electoral college votes that we're missing in states like wisconsin philadelphia i mean you know pennsylvania i'm sorry wisconsin pennsylvania i mean so you have those very michigan that usually were blue in states that we lost as democrats so i mean to that point there's i think a lot of messaging of a decade of messaging from both parties that i think end up with a result at this election cycle one thing that I've heard that's interesting is describing how women were split because Clinton, as you mentioned, did win some significant groups of women. She won minority women. She won white college educated women by the same margin that Romney did four years ago. So that's quite a, sw a swing. And she eked out married women as well. Um, but it's interesting to hear this term fractured sisterhood that we don't really have women all aligning one with one party and the question there is that question of should we assume they should but one thing that we do see is that democratic candidates that are women are more they're more in the national government they're more here in the state government so what does that say about utah we have this super majority of republicans are we going to be seeing more women winning in utah or um, in office in Utah, Senator? Well, I, I think one of the issues in Utah is <clears throat> a redistricting process. So it's really unfair to have this conversation without addressing gerrymandering that uh, they master here. <laughs> so that's an issue because, you know, Democrats put a lot of women on the ballot. If you look at how many women were on the ballot in 2016 or even 2014 at congressional races, I include myself in that group. But, you know, the districts are not winnable. So I, 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 if we have women in the Democrats, from the Democratic side running, they're lacking Republican women. I mean, if we have more Republicans, women Republicans on the ballot, they'll win because <laughs> those districts are just, you know, uh, the way they're redistricted. So um, I think that needs to be acknowledged when we're having this conversation because it's not only about having good candidates or bad candidates. If the district is the way right now they are, you know, Chaffetz, Stewart, I mean, 
they wouldn't be there if it was a competitive district, you know, if you have a chance to compete. If you put women there like Mia Love, I mean, Mia Love is there because she, you know, it's a woman and she put herself, but she's a Republican. It's a Republican district. Um, competitive, probably the, the only competitive district. And even then, I mean, you look at the breakdown, it's still pretty Republican. Um, so uh, to me is, yeah, I think the Republicans need to do more. And I say that with my colleagues at the legislature, when we have more women, even if they are in the other side of the aisle, we can, we accomplish a lot of things. We well, work closely together. And you're just making a good faith effort that way. I mean, you have the women. Bipartisan uh, efforts. The bipartisan effort to get women into office at every level of government, which I have written about. And, yeah. and I will say it's encouraging. And it's As a citizen up. and I a think voter, it's, it's really encouraging. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, with the Republicans, we see not only do we have some really difficult districts for them to win in, but we have this recruitment problem. Mm -hmm. And research, even research done here in Utah from BYU shows that when the Republican Party has made efforts to recruit women, we do see more of them running for some of those leadership positions. So what do you think the Republican Party can do to perhaps recruit some of these women? I think we need to continue those efforts to encourage them. If, you, if you're just talking about it at first, then it, it, they're thinking about it, and that's the first step. I think the second step is that men have to encourage women to do it, because our men, right, our, our leadership position, position are have men in them and and the other people listen to our leaders so if our leaders are encouraging women or are telling everyone well this woman is you know is qualified for this I think that would make a, a, a huge impact on the success of, of Republican women in the state so you have to think about the late Becky Lockhart and how and her success and how long might it be before we see another speaker, another speaker who's female or in president Utah of or president of the Senate. Right, yeah. our leadership numbers are awful. The Republican leadership numbers, uh, the representatives and the and the senators in leadership, we have There's zero. Yeah, no we, have, we have no Republican women in leadership. And I know we don't have all the numbers, but are we going to come out and net gain for women in the leg state legislature? At least do we two think? seats for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. Yeah. So one Which thing that still is going to put us probably at 18 percent. So it's telling, right? I mean, so we're at 16 percent of in the state legislature of having women um, in the legislature. That we're what 49 in the country. This by one more or two more, it, we will get 20 percent. So well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, it's not any better in journalism. Women are 38 <laughs> percent of the workforce in newsrooms across the country, and that number's only improved by four percent in 30 years. Wow. So wow. you know, we're at a disadvantage. So with that, concession speeches are always a, s a hugely important part of every presidential election. And Clinton's concession speech is being called pretty effective and some people are saying graceful. The question was whether Trump would be able to do that and then as we saw with election night, it was her responsibility. One of the things that has really seemed to resonate with people is that she put out this call to action. She said our democracy demands our that we be involved all the time, not just every four years. So do you think Utah women will answer that call to action, Senator? I've seen it, I mean, at least on, in a, anecdotal social media. A lot of, and of course, granted in my universe of maybe more progressive women, all of them are right now actually making commitments. It's interesting, like they're, they had like a grieving process and now they're like, you know what, I need to move it to the next thing. The next thing is I'm gonna give money to this organization. I'm gonna be voting, I mean, uh, volunteering. It's been, I've never seen this before. And then it's tagging to other women and saying, what are you doing? So they're tagging amongst themselves. I'm, I'm proud. Yeah. I'm excited. Um, you know, it was hard. I have to tell you, I, I mean, I was one of those very depressed people. <laughs> um, I still trying to g get over the depression of what happened with the, el the election. But just to see those women standing up or just saying, what can I do to help others? I, it's encouraging. So I, I think it is. It was effective. Um, and, and, and she is an, a, a figure, right? It's going to be a figure in our history. I mean, you know, whether you like her or not, she made history. And, and it's exciting to see what's next for women. Michelle, what do you think? Did it resonate with conservative women or Republican women? Um, I, I think so, because I think the uh, candidacy of, of Trump in general didn't, uh, w wasn't a, a, a usual effect upon Republican women. You know, we were, we were split as well. And, and so I think a lot more women were active before and will see the importance of staying active. And, and I still think it's, it's just as important for everyone to be proactive in how they're encouraging others, how they're encouraging their daughters, you know, these pipelines, the Utah uh, statistics on women finishing college, you know, all of those things matter. And I think the state is beginning to see that 
you know, it, it matters together to get to this point. We need more than one. And I think in a more general way, what she's talking about is uh, country over partisanship. It's about, uh, you know, the process that we believe in in democracy of working together towards a common goal and that may and encouraging women to be at the table and have an active participatory voice in that in it's in that and process requiring not encouraging yeah, not anymore. Re requiring we need to is move right to requiring these the names that are, are being you know uh, fl you know swept about for possible cabinet members for Trump, I keep hearing men. You yeah. know, where are the women numbers or the women names? And require it. And within Utah as well, when we talk about who could possibly run for the U.S. Senate or mm -hmm. for the governor's mm -hmm. spot in the next few years, right. it's primarily men. Men, 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 right. So I, uh, we do have a predominant religious culture here that sort of has uh, maybe sometimes a mixed message for women. Mm -hmm. It encourages uh, academic scholarship and achievement, but at the same time encourages motherhood, and I don't know if that's a challenge that women in Utah have a difficult time um, navigating. It is. It's a cultural, it's a, uh, there's a cultural bar that we're up against there. But some women, you know, find that it works for them, and those, we, we need to encourage them. And you know, right. and, I, and I've noticed right. that when women actually run for office, there is good response, especially at the local level, because it's obviously more person to person. It's harder on these huge races, but I've seen very successful women, both Democrats and Republicans, that because they connect to people, they have a base. And they're not only women. I mean, they're men involved. I mean, so you have to find your allies, to your point. Right. You can't just run a campaign just for women or just for men. Right. Because right. you know, for that's Republicans 50% of the especially, yeah. we just 50%. have to be candidates. We can't be a woman candidate. Right. Oh, I'm so sad. We have to end our conversation here. This has been so wonderful. Thank you so Good much to, to our panel Thank for you. being with us. That's it for the Hinckley Report. For more political analysis and news, please check out our Hinckley Report web extra. We'll be back next week. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>